Our reading today is from Romans 12, verses 9 to 21. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Sharon told me a story from the ministry that she and Michelle conduct each week at the pedestrian gate to our church property. There's an elderly man who comes to the gate about once a week looking for food. And Sharon says that every time she passes him the food, which is uh, simply half a loaf of bread and a tin of beans or something like that, before receiving it, he makes the sign of the cross across his heart. He says, thank you. And then he speaks a blessing. God bless you. God bless you. If you could pick just one word to describe that little story, I wonder what your word would be. Dallas Willard, who's one of the most defining voices for my own life, insisted that for clergy and other Christian preachers and teachers, when we preach and teach, we have to, he used the phrase, we have to serve what we're cooking, meaning we must give people that which is at work in our own lives. We have to live what we are teaching. We don't get to serve takeaways, uh, someone else's work or thoughts or writing. This has to be our preaching and our teaching has to be the product in one way or another of our own lives. And Dallas is of course right, because in any discipline there is authority when the person who is teaching has actually lived those lessons. They've they put it into practice. But we also need to give ourselves a little bit of latitude here, I think, because Dallas's words might prevent almost any Christian preacher teaching on anything if we have to master everything that we're going to speak on. And I'm very conscious that I am now and always will be an amateur follower of Jesus. So I've not mastered anything. One of the gifts of preaching from the lectionary is that you get confronted with scriptures you otherwise might not have chosen to preach on for yourself. And each week there are four passages of scripture, so you do get some choice. You do get a sense of what resonates with me, what speaks to me. But there's no one holding a gun to any preacher's head to say, this is what you have to speak on. So it can be tempting when you're confronted with, with a, a challenging passage it can be tempting to just uh, avoid the ones that are harder to speak on, just to skip it. But that's not the purpose of Scripture. The writer of Hebrews understood what he was talking about when he said that the Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges 
the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So scripture has been given to us to interrogate, uh, not in the spy movie military sense, uh, but to, to explore, to penetrate our lives and break into the depths of who we are. And it is given to us to judge, not in the condemnatory sense, but in the sense of going, this is good and right, and this is wrong and not a way in which we should walk. So instead of avoiding this very challenging passage today, I decided to walk straight into it. Not because I'm an expert, or to use Dallas's image, not because I'm a master chef in this field. In fact, I feel quite the opposite. But I do know this to be true. I believe these words that Paul has written for us, and I am devoted to them. I do want to see them more deeply at work in my own life. And in that sense, this is what I am cooking. In my life, I've not done much camping. When I was a child, we did a little bit of that as a family. And in my 20s, I did a little bit of backpacking with a tent. Uh, but those were the days before these new fancy tents had all these built-in support structures. So the tents that I remember failed or succeeded by how well you set up your poles and your ropes. Poles and ropes because they were the skeleton they were the framework across which the canvas could be stretched and romans 12 the passage we read today was written for the house churches in rome these small gatherings of christian people that were scattered across this ancient city and after paul tells these christians to uh, to not behave and think in the way that the rest of the world does he then goes on to instruct the Christian community to live their lives differently. And when he says differently in the context of this passage, differently means to live in love with one another. Or maybe the phrasing's better if I say to live lovingly with one another. So I don't know about you, even as I read it this morning, but I find verses 9 to 21 quite bewildering. It can feel uh, for me like a bunch of instructions being flung at you like tennis balls out of one of those tennis ball serving machines. If I read them too quickly, I sometimes feel like dodging and ducking them as they come at me. But I think all Paul is doing, it's a bit like Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. All Paul is doing is he's giving us poles and ropes. He's giving us the essentials, the skeleton, the structure for what it means for people to live together lovingly. Now what I worry about as I preach is that you, as I know I have done before, might just want to switch off at the sound of that word love. Because it is a huge word, it's a common word, and it means so many different things to different people at different stages in their life. I mean, I can love chocolate, my dog, my wife, my friend, and my TV set, and each of those words then uh, retranslate our understanding of the word love. So when we say love, we, we have to try and understand what it is we mean and what, is, what does Paul mean in this passage. I think that in the Christian community on the whole, and obviously it was happening then and I think it still happens now, I think love is often thought of superficially and or sentimentally. Uh, I think that we often experience church community as being a group of like-minded people who, when they get together, they deal with each other kindly uh, most of the time, and if not most of the time, at least some of the time. But even before COVID, uh, I, couldn't have, uh, I couldn't have stood to listen to another sermon, not that I've heard too many on them, but I have heard, I have heard Christian preachers teach on love uh, and I couldn't bear the, the idea of another sermon on hugging, kissing, hand-holding and swaying to gospel music as some expression of Christian community. Because I just don't think that's what Paul means at all. Paul's instruction to us in this passage, these instructions, they're rooted in a much, much grittier experience of love. Uh, this, this picture might not make sense to you, but this is what happened in my head when I was preparing. Uh, this kind of love that Paul describes feels like someone with a mallet knocking a tent peg into the ground. 
or poles being awkwardly put together and those poles sometimes fit and they sometimes fall apart as you're trying to get the tent up and they have to be joined again and it feels like ropes being pulled tightly in opposite directions and then all covered with a piece of canvas that is stretched to its limits. It feels like that for me. That's what the love feels like with all those pushings and pullings and knockings and, and challenges. So there is a kind of kissy kissy huggy huggy kind of loving that goes on and that people are understandably fond of. But I don't think that's what Paul is on about here in any way whatsoever. He begins by reminding us in our reading that at the outset our love must be genuine. Our love must be genuine, must be real. It has to be authentic. There's no room for superficiality and sentimentality here. It's authentic. And that out of an authentic relationship, uh, there, these are relationships committed to not giving evil a foothold. So when, rela when relationships go awry or when there's difficulty, uh, evil can get a foothold in there. And Paul says, in your relationships, love means not giving evil a foothold, but clinging to what is good. And such a powerful word that eh? to cling. It means this isn't easy. It means holding on with all your might. And these are relationships focused not on, uh, not on what we get out of them, but it's how others can be celebrated and he uses the word honored. So we enter into these relationships not about what I can take from them, but what can I give into them. And these are relationships committed to us working hard together in serving the Lord. There's no place for Paul in this for laziness. It's about people working together uh, with zeal, with diligence to serve the Lord. And then he paints this picture of this, you could all like, call it an ethos if you like, it's enveloped, this community of faith and of love is enveloped with joy and patience and prayer. They are constants in the, in the outworking of relationship for this community. And then he speaks about financial generosity that is extended towards the saints. So in other words, towards the Christian community and towards those within the Christian community. And beyond that, he says, there's also hospitality towards strangers. You know, the kind of strangers who come to a gate looking for half a loaf of bread and a tin of beans. And he says that when there is conflict, because a number of these verses deal with conflict, when there is conflict, enemies are blessed blessed and not cursed. And he describes it as a community of compassion. And he says that when, when one person rejoices, we rejoice with them. And when someone weeps, we weep with them. And he challenges us to not be arrogant in our communities, but to associate ourselves with lowly people. And then that very helpful verse when he says, as far as possible, uh, as far as possible, meaning that sometimes it might not be possible, but as far as possible, live peacefully with one another. And then he, it's like he goes back again just for a moment to remind us of this important ethic, this important value. He says, in this community, people do not take revenge when they are harmed. In fact, they bless their enemies. They bless their enemies. And they overcome evil, not with more evil, but by, if you know what I mean by this, by swamping the enemy with goodness. Man, I don't know about you, but I find that both daunting beyond belief. And also, though, I am filled with a peculiar hope. It really does. When I read that, I am daunted and I am filled with hope. Because human relationships are unavoidably complicated and they sometimes are difficult and they sometimes are very, very difficult. But where there is love, there is always hope. And let me say it again, it's not the love of books and films and songs. It's this gritty, authentic love that Paul reveals in this passage. It's real. It's difficult. It's not love that is just straightforward and simple. It requires effort. And on the whole, I think on the whole, it requires far more 
than any of us can accomplish on our own. But I want to say to you today, this gift of love that Paul describes, it's in you already. It's a God-given gift to you. It's in you already. And by God's Spirit, you and I do have the capacity for this extraordinary love. The kind of love which blesses even enemies. 